So this morning we're continuing our series, You'll Get Through This, and I want to read this, and then I'll probably read it again. Uh, this is from a book, uh, it's actually from the Bible, but it's from a book, this statement is from a book by Max Licato, uh, from a book called You'll Get Through This, and he says, you'll get through this, it won't be painless, it won't be quick, but God will use this mess for good. Don't be foolish or naive, but don't despair either, with God's help, you'll get through through this. Now, I got to admit, being up here this week with actual faces in the crowd is a little weird for me, but I am so glad to see you guys. And uh, uh, I want to say hi to a few people online, though. Um, CK and David. David, are you watching online while we're... Maybe your wife is using your their thing. All right. Oh, by the way, somebody said that that music leader is a hunk. And then I looked, and it was your wife <laughs> online saying that you're a hunk, just so you know. And Holly Roberts, good to see you. Mary Ware and Michelle Alexander. See, that's who it is. And then uh, Phyllis, we're glad to have you. Bruce Turner, all the way from Virginia, one of my former pastors from years ago who put up with me for a short time. Diane Listy is watching this morning and Perry Johnson and so many others. Even your wife, Jenny Michaels, is watching Brian. She just couldn't get enough of you, so she's watching. And of course, we got Buckles watching. Denise Buckles, her last name is Buckles, and I inevitably call her Buckles because I'm weird. So here's what I want to tell you about life. And as we talk today about God is good, I want to talk about the times in life that are the winter times. The times in life that are the tough times. How many of you have ever used a rake like this? One of these rakes. Now, if you've used one of these rakes, one of two things has happened. Number one, you've got to rake some tough stuff. Or number two, you can't find your other rake. One of those two things has happened. Because this is a great rake when you're trying to break up soil. Or you're trying to pull rocks out. Things that are difficult to kind of plow through. These, this is a rake for the tough times. And the truth is, when it comes to life, if you think about it, even in Florida, when winter comes and the leaves come off the tree and they're all over your yard, if you don't take time to get those leaves up in one way or the other, whether you use a rake or whether you've got a lawnmower and mulch it 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 and mulch it, and you're one of those people that just keeps running over it until you finally get rid of them. If you don't rake those leaves up in those seasons where life seems dead, then you're not ready when the season changes. And so today I want to talk about the fact that you have to sow in the setbacks of life to reap the success. Because what happens to you and what happens to me is when some often when we go through a hard time, we just try to survive it. We're like a, a kayaker or a, or a person in a, on the rapids who's lost their paddle and we think, well, we just hang on. But the truth is God has given you things to do even in the toughest time. And I know this because I look at the story of Joseph, and that's what was happening with Joseph over and over. Today we're going to look at this idea of the setup, setback the setup, and the success. How God used that setback in his life, then he set him up for success, and then success came. And it's true for all of those, but even in the hardest time, even that setback, and you may be in a setback time now, maybe it was something a doctor said to you, maybe it's a situation that's happening at home with one of your kids, maybe it's something that's happening in your, maybe it's just your emotions. Maybe you're just dealing with a setback and emotionally right now, and you can't even figure out why. You're just feeling down or grumpy or exhausted. Whatever that is, I want you to know that God is good even in the middle of that. So I'm going to give you three points today. Here's the first one. Focus on God in the setbacks. Now that is a lot easier said than done. Because when those speed bumps of life come, we tend to focus on the speed bumps and not God. And if we're not careful, we'll be so focused on those speed bumps that just like a farmer who doesn't pay attention to going in the right direction, he goes off track. We've got to go back and say, God, I want to focus on you. Listen to what happened in Genesis 40, verse 2 through 8. 
Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the same prison where Joseph was confined. Now, let me go back and give you a little background in case you missed the last few weeks or you were napping during this part of the sermon. Here's the deal. So, so Joseph... First of all, he's dragged away from home, dragged away from home. It, later on, we find out that Joseph was begging his brothers not to let him be taken away. Imagine that scene. Imagine how traumatic that had to be. Imagine the PTSD you would have from that experience. Then he finally makes it into Egypt He's learning the language. He gets to be promoted. He actually is in Potiphar's house, and he's good-looking. And Potiphar's wife comes after him, and he rejects her, so she falsely accuses him. By the way, theologians argue about whether she might have done that anyway. And so he's thrown in jail. By the way, many also think that if he really believed his wife, that he would have killed him instead of having him thrown in jail. But here he was in the king's jail. So Joseph is in this place now. How would you feel if all of this happened to you? What would you be focused on? Listen to Joseph in this story. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph and he attended them. Do you hear this? Joseph was given responsibility in jail. He had moved up in Potiphar's house and became over Potiphar's house. He was learning leadership that whole time. And now even in jail, he did not quit saying, you know what? I'm just going to continue to do what God wants me to do. Now, I don't know about you, but when hard times come, it is easy to say, you know what? When things get easier, then I'll do what's right. When things get easier, then I'll make that phone call. When things get easier, then I'll, maybe I'll forgive that person. When things get easier, then I'll make that decision to go forward. But the whole time, Joseph, it seemed like he just kept going down and going down and going down into Egypt, down into the well, down into this prison, which he later calls a dungeon, by the way. By the way, our prisons would be so much, they'd be like first class accommodations. After they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker, the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream the same night. And each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody in his master's house, why do you look so sad today? Time out. We have a prison guard here today. I'm guessing one of the questions that you don't ask the prisoners is, why are you so sad? I mean, that is not a question you ask somebody when they're in jail. Because the answer is typically going to be either a punch to the face, or why do you think I'm sad? I'm in jail. The other thing you'll notice is Joseph noticed other people. That tells me that he has already, already been working on forgiveness. Because here's what I know about unforgiveness. When you haven't forgiven someone, you tend to focus on yourself or that person. And you don't pay attention to the things around you. We've all met bitter people who struggle and they tend to not focus on helping others. They tend to focus on their own bitterness and they become more and more selfish. But Joseph noticed they were dejected. Why are you sad? And then they said, we both had dreams, but there's no one to interpret. And then Joseph said, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. Joseph already is continuing to give God the glory. Hey, you want to know about your dream? God can do that. God can do it. In his darkest moment, Joseph continued to look to God for help. So Joseph interprets their dreams. It's very interesting because first he interprets the cupbearer's dream. The cupbearer's dream was very positive. And when he finishes, it's really funny in the original language. It's the idea that the baker said, hey, that was a great interpretation. Tell me what mine means. And then his wasn't so good. But then Joseph says this. He says, when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. 
Joseph is saying to him, hey, hey, please remember me. Please be kind to me. Just, just mention me to Pharaoh. And then he says, I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. You'll notice that even though I believe Joseph has forgiven, it doesn't mean he's forgotten. This word forcibly carried off is a very strong Hebrew word for kidnapped. It's a horrible word. And Joseph was not making less of what his brothers did. He didn't say, what my brothers did was awesome. I'm so glad to be here in jail in Egypt, in Iraq. This is awesome, right? If you were dragged off to Iraq tomorrow, would you be a little nervous? And even here, I've done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. A few verses later, he restored the chief cupbearer to his position. So once again, he put the cup into Pharaoh's hand and he impaled the chief baker. Poor baker. Just as Joseph had said to them, the chief cupbearer, listen to this, however, did not remember Joseph. And in case you didn't get the point, he forgot him. Something good happened to him, he forgot all about him. If you're Joseph, I'm sure in the king's prison, every time a new prisoner came in, he would say to him, hey, uh, is, is the cupbearer still working for the king? Oh, yeah, yeah, he's doing a great job. You should see him taste the thing. He hasn't died yet. It's great. By the way, that was their job. They would taste the wine before the king got it, and the king would watch him for a couple minutes. Okay, now I can drink the wine. Nice job. Do you like that job? That's an awesome job, isn't it? You would definitely protect the wine, and that was the whole idea. The idea of the cupbearer was the idea that he would protect the wine because he had to drink it first. By the way, during World War II, my grandfather built bombers. I believe out in Iowa, somewhere out in the middle of nowhere. And it was cold. And the way that they would inspect the planes is they didn't have time to have inspectors. So the way they would inspect the planes, they'd get all the guys to work on the planes. And after they worked on the planes, they would get every single person who had worked on the plane on the plane. And they had to circle the field. You would be make sure you got those bolts in, wouldn't you? And that's what my grandfather did. They'd all climb on the plane, and then they'd go around and come back. And you're like, I got that. If you were the cupbearer, it was the same idea. You were going to make sure that every step of those grapes were protected because you were the first one to drink it. Here's a guy who knew details, and he forgot Joseph. That made it even worse. Here was a guy who protected the king, and Joseph told him, you're going to be back. And it says he totally forgot about him. If Joseph didn't already feel re rejected by all his stepbrothers, by Potiphar and his whole family, now he's been forgotten by somebody that he helped. He went out of his way to help this guy, and this guy did nothing to help him back. You been there? You ever been there? Maybe, maybe you've been in Potiphar's house where you helped somebody and you were attacked. Maybe you were just an innocent child and you were attacked by somebody in your family. Joseph relates. Maybe you've been forgotten by somebody who matters to you. Well, you have a choice. Are you going to trust that God can get you out when he's ready? Are you going to trust that God is good even in the darkness? Or are you going to focus on bitterness? I heard a pastor talk about a lady who he counseled. And, and she had gone through a horrible marriage with an abusive person. And she went through a divorce. And after that divorce, they were praying. He and his wife were praying for them. And began to pray, God, bring her someone new so she can see your love. And finally, somebody showed up. And, and he began meeting with her. And the pastor said... That guy actually came to him not too many months later and said, I can't date her anymore. And the pastor said, why? He said, because all she talks about is what happened to her in the past. If you don't let go of your past, you can't be prepared for the future. Don't carry that anchor around. Everyone has setbacks. If you're watching, listen, wherever you're watching from today, you've dealt with a setback. Everybody in this room has dealt with one of these setbacks. Focus on God. 
God, I'm not going to focus on the pain. I'm not going to focus on the hurt. Now, that doesn't mean that you say that it's not a big deal. It doesn't mean that you forget it, but it means you forgive it. And you learn to say, they no longer owe me a debt. I release them. It doesn't mean you need to hang around them. It doesn't mean they need to be a part of your life. But it means you have to let it go. Number two, be prepared for the sudden setup. Things change suddenly, and you've got to be looking the right direction. As I drove here today on I-95, in the middle lane, the guy next to me swerved into my lane. Into my lane. And I looked over, and he had his head down, looking at his phone at 70 miles an hour. Well, he's going faster than that. And almost hit me. Why? His eyes were on the wrong thing. Now, it's very easy for us to say, nobody should ever do that. <clears throat> and it's easy to say that nobody should get their eyes on their past. Nobody should get their eyes on their hurt. Nobody should keep their eyes on their selfishness and their self-centeredness and their hurts and their pains and their struggles. But it's very easy to get so focused on our own needs and our own desires and our own hurts and our own wants and our own failures and our own past problems. That in this moment, we don't pay attention to what's going on around us. We need to be prepared because God is preparing you even now, regardless of what you're going through, he is preparing you for what he wants to do next. And let me give you a secret. It's not what you think. Because we tend to have an idea of how God's going to work things out. And guess what? We're not very accurate. The good news for Joseph is he had a dream that his brothers were going to bow down to him. Remember that? I believe Joseph always remembered that dream. He didn't know how it was going to happen. He didn't know how it was going to work out. All he knew was, I'm going to be faithful to God. Two years later, two years passed. By the way, it's been two months since we've been in church. Doesn't it seem like forever? Imagine two more years in jail. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph. Listen. And he was quickly brought to the dungeon. So the cupbearer hears about the Pharaoh's dream and says, Oh, I am so sorry. I know a guy. Suddenly he's Italian. Right? Hey, 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 Pharaoh. Oh, man. Two years ago, this guy interpreted my dream. Pharaoh had to be looking at him like, what? He says, uh, 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 yeah. He says, you haven't been in prison in years. He's like, yeah, yeah. I remember this guy from, I know a guy in prison. He can help us. Now, how's that for a comment? So Pharaoh sent for Joseph. Listen to this. He was quickly, once again it says dungeon, quickly brought from the dungeon the darkest, wettest, grossest, they didn't have sanitation, place. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. By the way, uh, uh, Egyptians were notorious for shaving Everything so they didn't have lice issues and so that they didn't have uh, 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 different bugs on them. They, they would just and then they could put oil on them. They smelled really good. Egyptians were the best smelling people of their time. They actually thought that that Israelites stank because they were shepherds. Did you know that? That's one of the reasons they didn't like them because they stank and the sheep stank. You, you see that later in this story. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it, but I've heard it said of you. That when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Now this next sentence is actually one word. In the Hebrew language, this is one word. He says, I cannot do it. Okay, 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 wait, time out. You've been in jail two years. You get called before the head of... Of the whole area. He says, can you interpret a dream? This three words in Hebrew is one word. Joseph says, I can't do it. But it's literally one word. It would be like you going, nope. Your first words to the guy who can get you out of jail. When he says, hey, can you do this? Nope. 
How do you know you're going to get a next sentence in? But Joseph trusted God. Listen to what he says next. So he says, nope. Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Even though he's been in the pit, even though he's been dragged off to Egypt, even though he then got worked his way up into Potiphar's house and was falsely accused, even though he was put in jail and forgotten about for years, Joseph never took his eyes off of God. God is good all the time, and Joseph knew it. Joseph knew it. Have you ever noticed God is never early? Ever. You've been praying for something and wanting something. Every once in a while, a parent comes to me and says, Hey, I trained up my child, right? I, I thought that they would, they would, you know, follow God's ways. I said, yeah, it says in the Bible, and when they are old... I said, and so you need to start praying that your kids will get old. So often we go through life and we deal with something and we're waiting for God to move. And he doesn't move in our time, but he moves at just the right time. Corey Ten Boone said it this way. If you look at the world, you'll get distressed. If you look within, you'll get depressed. Been there. You ever look at yourself and like, I can't believe I said that. I met somebody for the first time. They had never met me last Monday. Instantly said something insulting to them. It took me about 12 seconds. Didn't mean to. It just... And literally 10 seconds later, I'm walking in the house going, I can't believe I just said that. So I thought, well, when my wife gets home, she's going to tell me it's okay. So she came home. I told her what I said. And she goes, you didn't say that, did you? I, I, I did. You were being funny, right? No. Uh... What did they do? They left. I would have left too. <laughs> if you look within, you'll get depressed. And then she said, but if you look at God, you'll be at rest. If you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. If you look at God, you will have rest. Listen to how prepared Joseph was. He had already thought about this position. By the way, he's giving his resume here. Listen to it. And now Pharaoh looked for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth, by the way, 20% giving there, of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of the good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by famine. Let me remind you of something. You have to plant in tough times to be set up for harvest. I know when you go through a hard time in life, sometimes you're just like, I'm just trying to survive. But the truth is, can I be honest with you? Sometimes the healing comes when you plant. Sometimes the healing comes when you give. Sometimes the healing comes when you make that phone call that you just don't feel like making. Sometimes the healing comes when you go and bless someone when you don't feel like doing anything. And you say, God, give me the strength to do what's right in the hardest times to go ahead and rake the soil. God, it seems so dead and dark and cold. But I'm just going to be faithful to what you want. See, all these times when Joseph was in Egypt, he never was free, ever. And yet, every time he gets promoted, you know why? Because he was working on his skills of organization and planning. So when this dream comes, Joseph presents a plan right away. Why? Because he was prepared. He didn't just wake up one day and come up with this idea. He knew how to plan. Why? Because he had been organizing even in prison. Finally, Focus on God and the setbacks. Be prepared for the sudden setup. Number three, my favorite part of this sermon. God receives glory when he brings success. I remember years ago, Harold Brantley went through a very hard time. Harold was my mentor for years and years. And about 20 years ago, he had gone through a very hard time. And I'll never forget meeting with him. And I remember I even bought him lunch that day, which was rare. He usually wouldn't let me. 
And I was talking to him, and he said, Eric, I want you to know something. I continue to just do what God wants me to do. I continue to give what God wants me to give. And all I could think was, well, I don't think you have anything to give. I continue to call pastors who I think need help. I continue to go out of my way to bless others. And I, He said, because I know that God always rewards us when we plant, when we sow. Then Pharaoh says to Joseph, verse 39... Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You're going to be in charge of my palace and all the people who are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Basically, he said, Joseph, I'm your boss, but you're in charge of everything else. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? Like, I'm going home, you take over, but if something goes wrong, I'm coming back. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He gave him the signature stamp. You sign my name for me. By the way, I'm going to tell you a story. My aunt, my uncle went to cash a check one time. Went to the bank. They thought he forged it. Because my aunt had signed so many of his checks, they thought it wasn't his signature. Couldn't tell that one, but he's passed away now, so it's okay. Right? Joseph could sign Pharaoh's signature. Joseph could do anything. By the way, when his brothers show up, you know what that meant? Joseph could have wiped them out immediately, and nobody would have asked him a question. He could have just said, swords. Pfft. Oh, leave Benjamin. He's my brother. Kill the stepbrothers. But he didn't. But he didn't. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring, put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and gave him a Mr. T starter kit. He went from chains of metal or iron or whatever they had then to chains of gold. Suddenly. And that's what God wants to do for you. Right now, your chains may be depression. Your chain may be a health condition. Your chain may be one of your kids that's not where you think they should be. Your chain could be a situation at work or not having work and you feel bound and you feel tied up. It could be somebody that hurts you and you feel bound up by that. I want you to know that if you will continue to sow in the hard season that God's going to have a gold chain for you. I pitied a fool that doesn't get a gold chain. Sorry, I'm a child of the 80s. In Romans 8.18, Paul says it this way, I consider that our present sufferings... Anybody in here like suffering? You enjoy? No. Nobody! Crazy people. Nobody! I consider our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. One day, when you and I show up in heaven, and God says, why should I let you into heaven Jesus is going to step out from behind God and say, it's okay, Dad, he's with me. And every hardship you ever had, even if your death was awful, even if you lingered, you will wake up that day, you will open your eyes that day, no more pain, no more suffering, the most joy you've ever had. And if you don't have that relationship with Jesus Christ, I encourage you, come talk to me today, or if you're watching online, send me a note, an email, a text. Because here's what I know. Not only is heaven about the sweet by and by where everything is awesome, I know that in the hard times when I'm tired of raking, when I'm tired of sowing, that there's so often that the Holy Spirit through God's still small voice speaks to me and reminds me, just do what's right. Leave the consequences to me. Just do what's right and leave the consequences to God. The success will outshine the suffering. Yeah, gonna, you're going to have setbacks. But if you prepare and get set up for what God's going to do next, continue to do what's right, you'll have the success that God has for you. But you have to sow in the setback to reap the success. You'll get through this. It won't be painless, it won't be quick, but God will use whatever mess you're dealing with for good. Don't be foolish or naive, but don't despair either. With God's help, you'll get through this. 
I'm going to pray for us before we close. If you need prayer, let me know. We are not going to do our offering in this service, but you can give online or you can drop it at the box on the way out. Thanks for coming today. If you're watching online, thanks again for participating. Next week, we will have a Saturday night service and the ability to pull in Saturday night. If you don't want to get out of your car and listen to the service, we'll have some speakers set up. If you want to sit outside for the service, there'll be all kind of ways for you to watch. You actually can sit back there and see me from under the tree. So we'll do that too next week. So we'd love to have you either Saturday night at six or Sunday morning at nine next week in person. Thank you guys for wearing masks. Those of you who can, I know not all of you can, but we're glad to have you here this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and your power and your will. I thank you for doing what only you can do. Bless each one here and each one watching at home or other places this week. Lord, I pray that if we're going through the hardship, those who right now, Father, they just feel worn out. That, Lord, you said you'd renew their strength as they wait on you. I pray this morning that you'd begin to renew their strength. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We have a great song to close our service.